Hello, it's Scott Manley here. It's time for another round of Deep Space updates. The last week or so of news. Um, yeah, and of course, the last week has, of course, had Christmas Day, where I got a nice set of uh, flight pedals and yoke and rudder and all that stuff, so I'm going to be flight simming away. But, but look, in terms of space, everybody's been talking about the James Webb Space Telescope, which launched on Christmas morning. Surprise! And uh, yeah, it took off in the Ariane 5 and headed for its injection orbit. And so far, the news has been great. Uh, there was initially some questions because immediately after deployment, when we got the very last view of the space telescope as it flew off into deep space, it deployed solar panel a few minutes before it was supposed to. And some people were concerned that that might be some indication of, you know, perhaps clock problems that... Uh, you know, the befell Starliner, but apparently that panel was supposed to deploy within a certain time or when the attitude got to a certain orientation and their, you know, motion rates had damped. So, yeah, the thing got under control and deployed that early. But so far, all the other deployments are going as planned. The antenna, the fore and the aft shield rack, uh, the tower raising is currently happening right now. That's where they move the mirror uh, hardware up away from the body so that the cooling gets better. Right now, there is actually a website which has just gone online that gives you the real-time temperature updates from the you know warm side and the cold side so we can watch the cool down happening. Um, the really good news is that they have, it had to make multiple burns uh, to get towards its target orbit. And the post-launch analysis from the navigation team shows that the orbit was hit by Ariane 5 with great precision. And so it's now projected to have more than 10 years worth of propellant uh, to sustain it. So that's going to be great. Of course, it might need to get some funding, but I'm sure that will happen. Anyway, there were lots of other launches in the last week. Um, well, week or so. On the 22nd, we had a Japanese H2A, uh, and it launched a commercial payload, uh, an Inmarsat, the Inmarsat-6, uh, towards geostationary orbit from Tanagisha. Uh, Tanegashima Space Center. I was can I can read that, but part can't parse it. Anyway, yeah, the H2 rocket is you know your classic Japanese launch vehicle right now. It's built by Mitsubishi, two stage hydrogen with solid rocket bo boosters on the side. Sometimes those are I believe supplied by Northrop Grumman. Uh, Japan is actually a relatively recent addition to commercial rocket uh, launch market. Um, I think their first commercial launch was in 2015, and I, there might only be one other. But yeah, you know, their rocket is actually really well set up for geostationary launches. It's an all-hydrogen launch vehicle, so it can really get those big throws out to GEO, and it can relight its engines. On the 23rd, uh, China launched a pair of satellites uh, called Xi'an 12 and, uh, 1201, 1202, and that used a Long March 7A. Um, so these were going to geostationary transfer orbit. It launched from Wenchang, which is their island off the south coast. Long March 7 is an all cryogenic rocket. The first uh, couple of stages are kerosene and liquid oxygen. It has potentially two or four strap-on boosters. In this case, it used four. And the 7A means that it's using a hydrogen upper stage on top of that, and that's how they get the spacecraft out to geostationary transfer orbit. Uh, basically, almost not long after, they also launched a Long March 4C, which uh, deployed Earth resource, you know, observation satellites. It had, it's called the, the Ziyuan, um, and I also had like a little radio CubeSat uh, experiment thing going off the back of it. So that uh, is an older rocket that uses, um, it uses, you know, hypergolic propellants. So yeah, this satellite will be able to carry out Earth observation, five meter resolution, with apparently 133 spectral bands to give them a complete coverage of everything that's going on, uh, you know, resource-wise. Russia made a launch of, uh, actually, no, Russia, first of all, I was about to say they launched Angara, but before that, they did a launch from uh, Baikonur of uh, payloads for the OneWeb constellation. So this is the fifth OneWeb flight this year. It's, of course, a launch on the Soyuz. It carries 36 satellites, and it's a collaboration between, like, StarSem, Ariane Space, and Roscosmos. Like, StarSem is this organization that does commercial launches for Roscosmos, I believe. Anyway, uh, 
But more interestingly, the Angara A5, that launched a couple of days after Christmas from Plisetsk. And this was supposed to have a mass simulator which would be taken up to geostationary orbit. So the launch went according to plan. The vehicle uh, ditched its boosters and, and uh, successfully placed the payload into a parking orbit. Then it was supposed to reignite its upper stage and deliver the payload to transfer orbit and the reignition failed. So this is a failed launch. The payload is spiraling back towards the Earth uh, over the next few days. The upper stage is the block DM-03, which uh, is also known as Percy. And it's new to the Angara, but uh, it's previously flown a few times on the Proton rocket. So no doubt there's supposed to be some investigation into this. This was supposed to be the last test launch of the Angara A5. Uh, they might have to do some follow-up on this, given this failure. Um, on the 29th, literally today, a few hours ago, there was another Chinese launch, the Long March 2D. Yeah, they're going through all their Long Marches, right? Um, they launched from Jiquan and they put the a satellite called Tianhui-4 into sudden synchronous orbit. And frankly, we don't know very much about this satellite. Uh, it's usually a code name for sort of like secret stuff. Anyway, in less secret stuff, in the southern hemisphere, if you look at the right direction at the right time, you can see Comet Leonard. It is putting on an amazing show. And I missed it when it was in the northern hemisphere, like it was just cloudy and everything. But now people are reporting that it has a tail of 60 degrees long as viewed from Earth, which is pretty darn impressive. What's really, like, I, I haven't seen a tail on a comet that long since I think Comet Hiyakutake in the, the late 1990s. But there's this amazing video from the remaining uh, stereo spacecraft, which is supposed to study the solar corona, solar atmosphere. And yeah, you can see the tail of this comet growing and billowing in the solar wind. Um, the two vertical lines on this, there's Venus and there's Earth. That's just because they're so bright, they saturate the whole CCD row. Um, elsewhere... Uh, there was a story that has been doing the rounds, and I've been asked a lot about it. Uh, NASA hiring priests to, you know, study the effects of discovering alien life on humans. I've seen this everywhere. Uh, like, it started out apparently with a story in the Times in the UK, and the headline was, Heavens Above, NASA enlists priests to prepare for an alien discovery. And, like, other outlets have since taken this story and run with it. They've given their own spin. I saw a story about NASA hiring 24 priests to answer this very question. And look, if you want to answer a question about how humanity would react to, um, you know, alien discovery, just look at science fiction. That is a theme that many great minds have studied for a long time. But anyway, the story apparently comes from a priest called Andrew Davison, who is a member of the Div uh, Faculty of Divinity at the University of Cambridge. And he pushed this story out to press. And it just so happens in the coming months, he's got a book coming out called Astrobiology and Christian Doctrine. So um, he's possibly using this to drum up some interest in his work. But the original story does have some sort of truth to it, right? It dates to like 2015 where um, there was a group called the Center for Theological Inquiry at Princeton University, New Jersey. And they were given a NASA grant to study, you know, various things, but specifically to study how society and humanity might react to discovery of alien life. But their project, they were given the money and then they hired other people to do it. And they brought in a whole panel of experts. It wasn't just, there was a handful of theologians and priests and stuff, but... The, there were also like sociologists and psychologists and politicians, people that understood society in general. So that's where that came from. Yes, there was a handful of priests involved, but look, this was a bigger question than that. And the story is largely being misrepresented. Finally, of course, we can't have a week without talking about SpaceX. And yes, the big news, I think, this week, there wasn't any launches, but... There was the news that the FAA, who were due to release their environmental report of Boca Chica on 31st, have pushed out that date to the end of February. And the reason for this given, the reason they gave for this is that they have had over 18,000 comments from the public expressing support and or opposition to this expansion of the capabilities down there. So 
yeah, they're saying, okay, we have to review all of these so that we don't f get sued by somebody for ignoring their feedback. And let me tell you, the feedback on this has been very good in some cases, and it has been absolutely wacky and crazy in others. And I'm, you know, I'm going to say from both sides, there's some wacky stuff from the fans and wacky stuff from the Elon haters. And somewhere in the middle, there are some really good comments on how, you know, this space facility can coexist with this uh, your protected lands. We've seen this happen before and it's something we need to consider. Anyway, uh, down there, while this has been pushing out the, the launch for Booster 4 and Starship 20, they just did have a static fire of Starship 20 this morning. And uh, I think at this point, you know, they're, they're going through sequencing, learning how to fire these engines. And every time they fire, a few heat tiles fall off. And it looks like, again, they lost a heat, few heat tiles. It, it's looking better if you ask me, but I'm not sure if that's just because they're getting better at understanding what makes them good or they're just replacing the ones that fall off until they get, you know, a vehicle where all the tiles don't fall off. <laughs> I'm still not confident that this will survive re-entry, but, you know, I think it will be spectacular one way or another. One thing that must have been spectacular that we did not see was what happened to Booster uh, 1069 on Just Read the Instructions. That was the that was a fresh booster on its very first flight. It carried a CRS-24 to the International Space Station, landed on Just Read the Instructions a couple of days before Christmas, and has taken a very long time to get back to port. And uh, yeah, it's... It's come into port and it is leaning and it it's right up against the very edge of the booster. And now that we get in close, we see that the engine nozzles are dented and Octagrabber is barely holding it down. So it looks like when you look at the live stream, it landed pretty much center of the deck and looked pretty straight. So it must have had some bad weather at sea and got blown over to the side. And some of the images you can see that, that one of the legs hit an I-beam that acts as a sort of lip around the edge, and the I-beam is bent. You know, that's, that, take, that takes quite a bit of force to do that. So yeah, I, I think that this happened probably while it was far out at sea, and then as it came back, it had to sit offshore off of the, the Cape for a couple of days as they offloaded the booster from uh, a shortfall of Gravitas. So. I'm wondering when we'll see this booster fly again. It just looks like the engines are damaged. I think the, the booster itself will be fine once they replace those engines. But yeah, that is, uh, again, you know, if, if you remember my interview with uh, Peter Beck, where he talked about the problems of using marine assets, you know, they're expensive and the results aren't necessarily what you expect and what you want. So yeah, that I think uh, rounds up my week. We've got uh, possibly one more launch this year, uh, later today, depending upon how things go. And yeah, then we'll be into 2022 and I'll see you then. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.